Okay, hello. It's the top of the hour. This is Mercedes Byrne Klug with the University of Iowa School of Social Work welcoming you to our December 19, 2012 webinar. Um, today's topic is behavioral care planning for psychotropic medications. And um, we have a very distinguished presenter um, who will be introduced shortly. But I have a few things I'd like to share with you. Uh, first of all, everybody who's attending this webinar, um, when you call in, you're then able to hear through your phone, but we can't hear you because everybody is muted upon coming. But you can send me a chat message at any time. I'll be checking the chat window. And then at the end of Dr. Boniface's presentation, we'll be opening up the floor for questions, comments, things like that. So um, in order to participate in the questioning and answer period, you'll be raising your hand, and then I will go in and unmute people who have their hands raised. Um, you do that through the computer, and then we'll all be able to hear you. If for whatever reason you don't want to speak into the phone, feel free to type in your questions, and um, we'll have them that way. I am going to ask that people wait until the end of Dr. Boniface's presentation for formal questions. Um, however, if you're having some kind of technical difficulty or you'd like her to repeat something or you didn't understand a definition, something like that that should be dealt with right away, then go ahead and put that in the chat box and I'll um, relay the message to Dr. Boniface. I want to also um, say that we are recording this session. It's being recorded right now and it'll be posted on the Nursing Home Social Work resource page within 24 hours. So if for any reason you're not able to stay with us for the full time today, you can listen to the whole thing. Or if you want to share it with folks, you can um, send them the link later. Uh, what I'd like to do now is um, introduce the person who's going to introduce our speaker, and that is Dr. Kelsey Simons. Uh, Dr. Kelsey Simons has been on the planning committee for this webinar, as has um, Dr. Robin Boniface. We started meeting last April to start planning these, and so she's, uh, Dr. Simons has been a key part of the committee, and she's been working with um, Dr. Boniface to get ready for today. She's a social scientist at the Rotman Research Institute, which is at Baycrest, located in Toronto, Ontario. So take it away, Kelsey Simons. Okay, well, thank you for that nice inter uh, introduction. I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Robin Boniface. Again, the topic is behavioral, behavioral care planning for psychotropic medications. Um, we have the next slide. Robin, would you advance the next slide? Uh, oh, I just did it, I think. <laughs> um, okay, Robin is an assistant professor at Arizona State University. She's had uh, 15, more than 15 years experience working with older adults and their families in long-term care and in inpatient psychiatric settings. Her research areas include enhancing social care for per, social, psychosocial care for persons with chronic illness and disability. Um, especially those with comorbid mental health conditions and those requiring nursing home care. She is a John A. Hart John a. Hartford faculty scholar in geriatric social work and earned her degree from the University of Washington in 2007. Um, so I will yield the floor to Robin. Okay, thank you so much, Kelsey, for that introduction and thank you to everyone who has um, joined in. I'm looking forward to talking with you about psychotropic medications. Um, nursing homes are kind of my thing, and within nursing home, um, the psychotropic medication was always something I enjoyed um, working with and um, care planning around. Um, so on that note, I'm going to go ahead and just jump right in so we can maximize the use of our time. So first, an overview of um, what we're going to do today. First, I want to just reiterate um, why it's important to be familiar with psychotropic medication regulations. Sometimes within um, social services, we see that more as a, a role of the physician or of the nurse, and there really is um, a strong role for social services, so I want to start our um, talk with that. And then I'm going to review 
three key federal regulations um, and the associated interpretive guidelines that go with those regulations around psychotropic medication. Um, specifically, I'm going to talk about FTAG 329, which is regulations about um, unnecessary medications, and then FTAG 330, which is specifically about antipsychotic medications and the um, appropriate diagnosis to support their usage and then FTAG 31, which is also about antipsychotic medications and specifically about dose reduction requirements. And then that will set the stage for talking about care planning and um, some guidelines that I have, some helpful tips that have been helpful in my practice um, for devising care plans that help us to be more compliant with the regulations. And then at the end, I believe we've left about 15 minutes um, for questions and discussion. So here's kind of the rationale I see for social services personnel being really familiar with the medication the regulations around psychotropic medications. First of all, they're they're used quite often in um, skilled nursing facilities, and even though we're working on reducing their usage and have specific uh, mandates around that, um, just given the extent of behavioral problems and um, psychiatric problems within the nursing home population, I think psychotropic regulations, I mean, psychotropic medications, are, there's always going to be some level of um, usage of that, um, so needing to, to be familiar for that reason. Um, and then they are very highly regulated. and even when they're used, we want to be sure that they're used within um, within the regulatory standards. And when we're aware of the regulations, we can help our facilities to maintain compliance. And at the same time, it's part of our role as resident um, advocates to assure that residents are receiving um, the best possible care, which includes some um, care that corresponds with um, federal regulations. So that's sort of my um, rationale for why it's so important. It's a part of resident advocacy and it's a part of um, our role in, in helping our facilities do um, a good job with our care. Um, before I get um, started, just to let you know that this um, book is a really helpful resource. Many of you probably have it already, um, but if not, it's one I would strongly recommend that you have um, all the interpretive guidelines that I'll be talking about. I mean, they're, they're right out of this um, book. I haven't invented them out of my head or anything. Um, so they are there. Um, there's probably one in your facility, either the administrator or the director of nursing has a copy. But if not, it's available from the um, American Healthcare Association. So it's a very good resource um, to have good for you know, there's so many regulations, you can't memorize them, and so you want to have, be able to look them up um, as you need them, and the book is very good for that. So on that note, I'm going to jump right into FTAG 329, um, Unnecessary Drugs. So here's what the regulation says about that, that all resident, residents must be free from the use of unnecessary drugs. And of course, the first question is, well, what's an unnecessary drug? So here's how it's defined. It's a drug that's used in um, excessive dose. So you're receiving too much of the medication um, for excessive duration, so receiving it for longer than they need it, um, without adequate monitoring, um, without adequate indications for its use, um, in the presence of adverse consequences, um, or any combination of these reasons. Um, and a, a couple of key things to point out here, um, without adequate monitoring. So a resident could have, you know, a behaviors that necessitate the use of psych psychotropic drugs. They could have a diagnosis that supports the use, but if it's not being monitored for side effects um, and its effectiveness, it can be considered an unnecessary drug. Um, the same with with um, not having adequate indications. 
So it could be that they're having the symptoms, they have the diagnosis, but if that's not documented and not easily located within the resident's medical record, then it can be seen as an unnecessary drug. So these are important um, components of the definition to keep in mind. And when we're first learning about this regulation, there's kind of a reaction like, oh, this is so much work, there's so much to, to think about, there's just all this, this stuff that's just making our work more complicated, and, and just to remember that that's really not what the regulation is about. It's about helping us to make sure we're doing a differential diagnosis when it comes to behavioral symptoms, that we're looking at um, what's the underlying cause of the symptom. Um, why is this happening? And making sure that psychotropic drugs aren't our first line of defense when there's a behavioral symptom or some type of problem. That first we're looking at environmental stressors, you know, having being in an environment that's too noisy and chaotic, for example, um, that there's not psychosocial stressors that perhaps the person is grieving a recent loss and that's why we're seeing the behavior. Um, and then again, um, that it's not a treatable medical condition. And I know many times in my practice, I would see people prescribed Haldol for, you know, which is a, a antipsychotic medication, prescribe that um, for behavioral symptoms that were caused by having a urinary tract infection. So these regulations are trying to help prevent that type of thing from happening, really getting us to look at what's causing the behavior. And there, are there other things that we can do um, that, that don't involve medications to help ease the person's distress? So here are some of the common medications that can be characterized um, as unnecessary drugs if um, they're not used um, according to the guidelines. So you want to be familiar with um, benzodiazepines, um, with anxiolytics, um, anti-anxiety medications, sedatives, hypnotics, and um, antipsychotics. And with your handout, there's a list um, of example medications. It's, it's not intended to be um, an exhaustive list but just to give you an idea of, you know, when we're talking about benzodiazepines or antipsychotics, what, what are some of those medications? So um, first we'll talk about benzodiazepines and what FTAG um, 329 has to say about their use. Um, so there's a lot of um, guidelines about the use of long-acting benzodiazepines. And, um, what those are is your, your um, anti-anxieties anti like um, Valium um, or Transine. Those are long-acting benzodiazepines. And the regulations say that we should not be using those types of medications unless we first tried a short-acting benzodiazepine and that failed. Now, your shorter-acting benzodiazepines are things like um, Ativan, which uh, many of us are probably familiar with, um, Xanax, those types of things. So we're, we're needing to try those types of medications first. And if they don't work, then a long-acting benzodiazepine um, can be used. Um, and even when that's the case, um, these requirements are still in place. We have to first make sure that um, other reasons for the resident's distress um, have been considered and they've been ruled out. So making sure that that anxiety they're experiencing is not being caused by pain, by urinary tract infection, um, by grief and loss issues, that sort of thing. Um, it also needs to be resulting in either maintenance or improvement of their functional status. So it actually needs to help the resident in some way and we need to document um, that. Um, at the same time, um, it can't be used for more than four continuous months. We have to do a dose reduction um, after four months to make sure that they still need the medication. So after four months, you have to try to reduce it and see if they can be maintained on um, a lower dose. 
um, and is so great. But four months later, you have to try it um, again. And there's also restrictions about the um, the dosage, so it can't be in a, too high of a dose. And um, in the long-term care survey, which is that red book I showed at the beginning, the dosage limitations are listed um, there. It's a little bit outside of the, the scope of this presentation, but just so you know that um, if you wanted to look up those um, dosage limits, um, you can see those in, in that book. Now, just looking at the benzodiazepines um, and other anti-anxiety medications and sedatives, um, it, regulations around their usage, um, again, it's pretty much um, the same thing. And this is for when they're used um, for things other than sleep. So if it's to treat um, anxiety, not sleep, again, we've got to be looking at other sources of the resident's distress. Um, it has to be maintaining or improving their functional status, and again, um, we can't use them for more than four months without um, trying a um, dose reduction, and then needing to try that dose reduction at least twice um, in a one-year period. More regulations are out there use. There has to be a specific condition that supports the use of these types of medications, and, and here's the um, conditions, of course, the general, generalized anxiety disorder. It makes sense that we would want to use an anti-anxiety medication to treat anxiety disorder. Also, um, delirium, dementia, amnesia, other cognitive um, disorders with associated agitated behaviors. So somebody with just a diagnosis of dementia without um, agitated behaviors doesn't justify the use of um, benzodiazepines or other anti-anxiety. Um, and if they do have the agitated behavior, we have to make sure that those behaviors are quantitatively and objectively documented. So we have to have numbers around how often um, the behaviors are occurring and what's exactly happen happening. Um, and then the behaviors need to be persistent. So it can't just be an occasional um, outburst, um, an occasional problem, but something that's ongoing. Um, again, not due to preventable reasons. Um, and then it needs to constitute a source of distress um, or dysfunction. And that includes two um, other residents. You know, is the behavior distressing to other residents in the environment um, or representing a danger to the resident um, or others? So with these cognitive disorders and agitated um, features, these um, requirements have to be met. Um, then also panic disorder is one of the conditions that's indicated, and um, symptomatic anxiety associated with other um, psychiatric um, disorders. So perhaps sometimes we'll see anxiety um, in conjunction with depression or anxiety in, in conjunction with um, bipolar disorder or something like that, so that um, warrants usage of these medications. Now, um, using them for sleep induction, that's um, the hypnotic um, medications, like your, your Ambien, um, Benadryl, those types of things. Um, it's the same type of issue that we don't really want to be using those unless other reasons for insomnia have been ruled out. Um, so are they not sleeping because they're in pain? Um, are they not sleeping because they're um, um, up at night um, worrying about something or, or grieving something and they really need an outlet to, to talk about that? Um, are they uncomfortable in their bed? Have they just had a nightmare? Those types of things. So ruling out other causes of um, insomnia. Um, again, um, when we do use them, it needs to help improve the resident's functioning. And these um, regulations are really um, meticulous here that with the hypnotics for sleep, that they can't be used more than 10 continuous days um, without um, a gradual dose reduction. So 10 days is a pretty short um, amount of time, and the expectation is that we'd be trying that um, three times within a six-month period um, before 
make in the assessment that it's um, contraindicated um, to discontinue it. Okay, so that was benzodiazepines, sedatives, hypnotics, and um, anti-anxiety medications. We're still on, anti, um, on unnecessary drugs, um, but now specifically looking at the antipsychotic um, medications. The, and they're on your um, list in the handout, things like um, Haldol, um, Seroquel, and Risperidol, those types of medications. Um, there's a dosage limitations um, for use of these medications um, as well, um, and those are listed in the long-term care survey book if you would like to look them up. Um, and there's specific regulations around the monitoring um, required, and there's quite a bit of things that need to be monitored when these medications are used. Um, first of all, there's tardive um, dyskinesia, which is your involuntary um, muscle movements, typically in the face, but um, also can be in the fingers or all different types of um, areas. Um, and that's where we do the AIMS testing every six months to monitor for tardive dyskinesia. Um, also looking at postural hypotension, um, cognitive or behavioral impairment um, associated with use of the medication, and Again, they're, they're meant to help improve behavior, but sometimes it can actually cause behavior to deteriorate or affect people's um, cognition, so monitoring that. Um, um, akathisia as well, which is just that um, kind of that inner restlessness that's just really uncomfortable for people, and then Parkinsonism. So um, typically it's some um, nursing that's monitoring these things, um, but just to be aware that these are some of um, the things you'll want to make sure is in the, the plan for your resident and um, documented in the record. Um, now, sometimes there is a need to use these medications outside of the guidelines, and there is um, provision for that, but um, there's a lot of documentation that's required um, to support the use of um, medication outside the guidelines. And here's examples of what would need to be in um, the records. There would need to be a physician's note documenting why the dose and duration is appropriate. Um, and then like another um, note from another physician or psychiatrist um, that supports um, the primary physician's judgment around the medications. Um, documentation that the person, the resident's being monitored um, for adverse consequences, um, documentation that dosage attempts have been um, tried and they have not been successful, that they've resulted in the behavioral symptoms returning, um, and then documentation that the resident um, demonstrates improvement or maintenance of functioning when they're on um, the medication. And, with that, um, that's often reflected in the in the MDS. You'll be able to pick it up um, there. So, so those are it's quite a lot of stuff that would need to be present to document use use um, justify use outside of the um, the, the guidelines. Um, so I'm going to um, move on to FTAG um, 330, which is specific to antipsychotic medications. Um, and here's the uh, basic language of the, the regulations that residents who um, have not used antipsychotic drugs in the past um, are not given these medications unless it's necessary to treat a spe specific condition that's diagnosed and documented in the, the clinical record. So there's kind of a key theme that everything needs to be um, documented. So these are the conditions um, that the resident needs to have one of these, one or more of these conditions um, to justify the use of antipsychotic um, medications. Um, your uh, schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder, delusional disorder, um, psychotic mood disorder, an acute psychotic episode, brief reactive psychosis, 
um, schizophreniform disorder, atypical psychosis, and uh, then also in Tourette's syndrome um, and Huntington's disease. And then last but not least is your um, delirium, dementia, amnesia, um, and other cognitive disorders with associated psychotic and or agitated behaviors. And with um, your dementia and cognitive diagnosis, there's a lot more information and a lot more justification that needs to be provided um, to um, justify the use of antipsychotic medications. So the psychotic and or agitated behaviors, it has to be, they have to be quantitatively and objectively documented. So again, numbers um, and you know, specifics about what's actually occurring. They need to be persistent um, behaviors, not caused by anything that's preventable, so not due to an infection or dehydration um, or being fearful of their roommate, those types of things. And then beyond that, they need, the behaviors need to contribute to the resident um, being a danger to himself um, or to others. Um, if it's continuously screaming, yelling, or pacing, those behaviors need to impair um, functioning. So it's not just, oh, well, they continuously scream, so they need medications. That continuous screaming needs to impair functioning. And it can be fairly easy to, to, to document why it impairs, um, impairs functioning. If somebody's continuously screaming, yelling, or pacing, they're not able to form relationships with their peers. Um, they're not able to have a pleasant meal. They're not able to really enjoy um, activities that they might have enjoyed, enjoyed in the past. So you can document and talk about how their behaviors interfere with this normal um, daily life. Um, and then the next thing is that the symptoms cause the resident distress um, or impairment. So if they're very upset about the behaviors, embarrassed about them or whatever, those are um, further justifications. And again, those are things that we need to be writing about and um, documenting in the record. Um, these are symptoms or conditions or behaviors that um, never justify the use of antipsychotic um, medications. So you don't want to have in your doctor's orders or in your care plans or anything you know, that says, you know, Haldol for treatment of dementia with agitated features as manifested by wandering or um, depression or in, insomnia or, or fidgeting. Those are never um, appropriate um, um, symptoms to justify the use. And the idea um, is that all of these conditions listed here or symptoms listed here are, are things that are um, indicative of something else going on and that we can easily treat, easily address um, without using medications. And I would just want to call attention to the, the last one there, um, agitated behaviors which do not represent a danger to the resident or others. So a resident may be um, displaying behaviors that, that we don't like or that are maybe annoying or irritating to, to staff, uh, but if they're not a danger to the person, um, if they're not disrupting other people or impairing, impairing functioning, that's not something that we would um, um, use an antipsychotic for. Um, you know, for example, somebody who um, sees um, flowers on the wall, visual hallucination of flowers on the wall, and and they're not upset by that, and they're like, oh, look at the pretty flowers, and, you know, it doesn't interfere um, with eating. It doesn't interfere with um, participating in activities. You know, for example, they're, they're not um, avoiding things just to stare at the wall all the time to see the, the, the flowers. And if it doesn't hurt them or impair functioning, it's not something that we need to be using an antipsychotic for. Now, on the other hand, if they're seeing flowers and upset by that, that's um, a different issue. Um, so the key is, you know, needing to, you know, if they are distressed by that behavior, to be able to document that and put that in the record, um, the, the evidence of their um, distress. 
Okay. Um, the last F tag to talk about is um, 331, which um, again relates to antipsychotic medications, um, specifically to their dose um, to the dose reductions required. And the regulation there is that any resident who receives um, antipsychotic drugs must also receive um, dose reductions and behavioral interventions unless it's contraindicated. So contraindicated, um, what that means is that if they have one of those specific conditions that I just talked about, um, the schizophrenia or schizophrenic um, disorder, um, atypical psychosis, if they have um, one of those um, and there's a history of recurring symptoms, then it's contraindicated. So, you know, they, they have schizophrenia. Um, in the past, they've had recurring um, episodes of, um, you know, really having significant behavioral symptoms that impair functioning. That's documented in the, in the record. Then you don't need to do the dose reductions. Um, also, if they have the organic mental syndromes, that's the um, delirium, amnesia, dementia, um, and it's been, a dose reduction has been attempted twice and hasn't worked, um, and it's resulted in their symptoms coming back, um, then it's contraindicated and you don't need to do it anymore. Um, also, if the physician um, can provide justification for the need of the medication, then um, it's contraindicated as well. And of course, um, that physician justification is quite, um, there's a lot of steps to it. Um, it would need to include the diagnosis, description of the symptoms, um, and then having a discussion of the differential diagnosis between psychiatric and, and medical diagnosis, so making it clear why the symptoms relate to the psychiatric condition and not some other underlying medical um, disorder. Then justifying the choice of treatment, why is the antipsychotic better than some other type of medication, an antidepressant for um, example, and why is the dose um, necessary? And when it says um, physician justification, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to be one big old long note um, by the physician, but supportive documentation can be um, factored um, into that, like I talked about um, in slide 15, where there's also um, perhaps a note from the psychiatrist, evidence in the record um, how they're um, functional status is improved when they're on the medicine. Okay, so that's my short haha, review of the, the regulations and um, what we need to um, be compliant with. So now I'm going to switch to talking about specifically about the care planning process and, and how we can use our care plans to help um, maintain um, compliance and, and really use it as a tool for that. Um, and as I just kind of a caveat before I pr present this is the idea that, is that there's many ways of doing um, care plans, many good ways. I'm just going to present the way that I used and what I found to be helpful um, with the idea that it may help um, you as well and not intending to um, negate, the, the, negate the value of other um, types of care planning strategies or, or things that you might be doing um, currently. So this is, this is um, one, day, one way um, that I've found helpful. Okay, so just to, to start, just a review of the basic um, elements of, of the care plan, and I'm sure that you're all um, familiar with this, but um, just to set the, the stage. Um, for how we would use this format um, with psychotropic medications. So you, of course, um, start with your um, problem statement, and um, the handout um, goes into um, more detail um, about, about the problem statement. But you just basically, um, as you know, start out with some general statement of the, the problem. Uh, mood and behavioral needs, or alteration in mood and, and behavior, whatever it is. Um, and then with psychotropic medications, it's particularly helpful if you then take that, that basic problem and tie it to the diagnosis. Um, so um, alteration in mood and behavior due to 
schizophrenia, um, alteration in mood and behavior um, due to um, Alzheimer's dementia with agitated features. So note um, the diagnosis um, because part of using being in compliant with psychotropic medications is using them for the appropriate conditions. So if you're noting that appropriate condition right in the care plan, um, you're, you're off to a good start. Um, then you want to list the specific symptoms the resident is um, experiencing. So what is actually going on? Um, you know, continuous yelling, help me, help me, help me. Um, when they actually don't have a need, you go and ask them, oh, what do you need help with? Oh, I don't need any help. Why do you say that? Um, is it striking out with content? Um, is it um, resisting vital personal care? You know, being clear um, and specific about what the actual symptoms are. And then um, noting the, the complicating factors. So those are the types of things that um, make the underlying problem um, even more problematic. So that's things like um, um, having a, a difficulty expressing their needs, um, having vision loss, um, having um, depression, having grief and loss, um, having uh, hearing impairment, um, having pain, those types of things. Um, and then I, I don't know that I listed it here on the PowerPoint, but I also um, try to include um, residents' strengths. And um, that's particularly helpful um, especially if you ha if you use a, a problem-based um, care plan and it's just this whole big long list of problems, 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 um, just to note that every resident does um, have strengths and just capture it there in the care plan, um, you know, whether it's having a supportive family or maybe having a couple of key um, supportive relationships with facility staff, um, those types of things. Just, you know, acknowledge that there's some positive things to work with um, and then other elements of the care plan, of course, include measurable goals, um, approaches, and interventions. Um, so measurable goals, is, is sometimes people um, struggle with this, and it's, an, it's particularly important to assure that our goals are measurable um, when, we're, when the person's on psychotropic medications because part of the regulations are that we're quantifying um, the behavior. So measurable goals can really help us quantify them. Um, so this is kind of worded for audience participation, but I'm not um, expecting that. The, the question is, I mean, you know, what's wrong with the following problem um, and, and goal? And I'll just tell you what's wrong. Um, so we see it says alteration behavior due to agitation, and the goal is, Episodes of um, agitation will decrease, and um, the the problem there is that agitation is just too vague of a term, and then the idea that agitation agitation will decrease that's not specific enough either. How do we know when it's decreased? If they're having a hundred episodes a day, um, and the next day they have ninety nine, has it decreased? I mean, what what are we really trying to achieve? So a better way to word that um, this problem would be to be clear about what the agitation is. So here it's some alteration in behavior related to agitation as evidenced by um, yelling, help me, wringing hands, um, distressed facial expression with inability to express needs. So if we just use the term agitation, I mean, that can be so many different things. I think there's... 30 people on the call, we'd probably have 30 definitions of agitation. But with this um, problem statement, it's really clear what the person is doing and what's going on. Um, and then the goal is that the continuous yelling help me will not occur during meals. So we're really focused on that particular time period. Um, that um, after we've done a one-on-one, -on -one, that they'll stop wringing their hands in that distressed way for at least 30 minutes. Um, and that they'll have re relaxed um, facial expression. So these are things that we can quantify um, and measure. Um, here's another example, um, alteration in mood as evidenced by daily episodes of anxiety during care and treatment. Episodes of anxiety will decrease to one time a week or less. 
And typically when people look at um, this problem statement and goal, um, they know that it's much better than the first one about education. Uh, but it, it's still not um, as effective as it could be, and that's because you know, what do we mean by anxiety? Um, what do we mean by daily? And what do we mean by care and treatment? Um, those are things that are really, um, you know, left for interpretation, and we don't want that. We want it to be clear and specific. So uh, a better a way to improve um, that statement would be um, alteration in mood with anxiety as evidenced by, and then we're explaining what the person's symptoms of anxiety are, um, crying, um, fearful statements, repetitive questions, um, trembling during care and treatment associated with the genital area. So that's a whole different problem than if it was, um, if that was occurring during um, bingo or something like that. Um, and I would actually take this a step further um, and give examples of the fearful statements and the repetitive questions, and there just wasn't room um, on, on the slide. And then the goal is that um, episodes of anxiety will decrease to one time a week or less. Um, so those are just some examples of making it more um, measurable, and it, it, it ties to being specific um, and clear. And that helps you quantify um, behavior. Now, with approaches and um, interventions, you're wanting to specify what the entire team is um, doing. Um, so that's not just what social services is doing, but noting what licensed staff is doing, um, what the nursing assistants are doing, activities, mental health, and things that all the staff are responsible for. And then you also want to list the psychotropic medication as one of the interventions and being clear that the medication is intended to help the person with whatever symptoms you've listed in the problem statement. And what I do is I always list the psychotropic medication last. And that's not because there's any law about that or anything, um, but it just, it just helps to highlight that all the other interventions that we're doing, um, the meaningful activities, the one-on-one, -on -one, the redirection, that those kind of take precedence. You know, they're highlighted over the psychotropic medication, whereas if you list it first, it just gives the appearance that it's the most, um, you know, that it's the, the, the prime intervention. So I list it last. Um, and then you want to note um, with that um, that side effects are being monitored, um, and then link the medication back to the care plan goals. So if you look at the um, example um, care plan here, down at the bottom, um, here this person is on Zyprexa, and you know it says right there, um, monitor side effects and effectiveness per goal number two. Um, and number three, so it's really evident on the care plan that the Zyprexa is specifically um, to help treat this um, fearfulness that others are plotting to harm her, um, and it's for striking out with contact. Um, it's all tied in right there um, to uh, on the on the care plan, so it's very integrated. Um, then, of course, other parts of the, the care plan is to be sure that we're using um, individualized approaches. And we all, we all know um, to do that. And sometimes we um, maybe are at a loss figuring out, well, where are we going to get these individualized approaches? So here's some ideas. Um, the social history, um, the social assessment has some good information about that we can draw on. Um, interviews with family members. Um, can give us good information. Often the nursing assistants have some really good input um, as well, and um, our mental health team, um, other social services professionals may have some ideas as well. And it's just as easy as um, this example here. And if we know somebody in, in the past that they enjoyed cooking, um, 
perhaps they would, a way that we can re redirect them is looking at cookbooks, looking at recipe cards. So, I mean, that would be an individualized um, approach. So just knowing information about the past person and, and what, they, what they enjoy, we can build on that information. Um, other suggestions that I've found um, helpful is that we can really use the MDS um, to help create an integrated care plan. And what's really helpful with um, care planning around psychotropic medications is to be sure that the care plan is um, integrated and that everything matches so that what the doctor's order says the medication is for is actually reflected um, in the, the care plan. Um, so the MDS is certainly a place to um, start in terms of identifying what the basic problem um, should be and then getting those exact um, symptoms in. And just for example, on the, on the, um, the mood section where we do the P PSQ-9, one of the questions is, um, um, being short-tempered and easily employed. And so if that's one of the things that your resident scores um, positively about, you can put that on the care plan, uh, but then being more specific about, well, what do they do when they're short-tempered um, and annoyed? So you might say, as evidenced by um, ongoing critical comments towards peers during meals and activities, um, and then an example of what they might um, be saying. And then... Um, the social history assessment, again, can be helpful. The activity preferences section, um, daily preferences, and customary routine section, they can be really helpful, too, to help us individualize the, the care plan. So the whole idea is wanting to integrate um, monitoring of the medications and quantifying the behavioral symptoms um, through the care plan, and that can help us adhere or comply to psychotropic drug regulations. So um, whatever it is that the psychotropic medication is intended to treat, that's what you want to list as your goal. And I don't know how many times I've seen um, in doing consultation work, they'll have a problem statement where it says the problem is one thing, and then the goal has nothing to do with the problem statement. And then when you look at the physician's order for the medication, well, it has nothing to do with what's listed on the care plan and what's listed in the goal. So all of those things um, need to match. And then when, we're, when we do that, it really um, helps, um, you know, keep us in um, compliance. compliance. So um, have the goal be what the medication is intended to treat. So if it's intended to treat dementia with agitated features, as, episode, as evidenced by um, striking out with contact, your goal in the care plan needs to be episodes of striking out with contact will um, decrease to um, zero. Um, if, if it's the goal is to decrease continuous calling out during meals or whatever it is, then that needs to be reflected in the care plan goal. Um, if you're finding yourself needing to have 10 different goals, um, what you can do to minimize the number of goals is just focus on the um, behaviors that are most um, problematic. I wouldn't have more than three or four um, goals. And then what you want to be doing um, for monitoring is actually having in your, you know, your medication sheets that, where the nurses document that they've given medicines, um, then monitor the episodes of target behaviors. And so then you have a real good um, documentation record of, yes, we're giving this medication, here's the reason we're giving it, here's the behavior we're trying to um, reduce, um, and here's the episodes um, that, we, that you have. So it's all um, lined up. And um, there's a couple of handouts that you might find helpful for this. One is a, um, a behavior monitor log, and the other one is a times um, behavioral log. And um, those can be useful ways. Or it can just be your standard, um, you know, those uh, block sheets where the nurses check off that they've given medication. You can just use that as well where they're charting um, the number of times the behavior occurred during um, the shift. Um, so here's um, an example of the way um, it might be 
integrated here. Um, so you have somebody on Zyprexa for treatment of dementia um, with psychosis, um, evidenced by visual hallucinations of bugs on the floor and in the bed. Um, and the assumption here with this is they're distressed by this. So if they're seeing butterflies and, and loving it, we wouldn't want to be medicating. But in this situation, imagine that they are distressed and upset by it. So our goal would be episodes of visual hallucinations um, would decrease. And then we'd be monitoring the number of episodes of visual hallucinations. Um, I'm just referring to the handouts there for you. Um, and my ideas about what you would um, do with this information um, is to work with your multidisciplinary team. Um, I don't expect one individual social services person to go out and do all this. It's something to work with as an interdisciplinary interdisciplinary team um, to update care plans, um, um, review um, the charting to make sure it's in compliance. And, you know, as I say that, to keep in mind that mastering this content is um, overwhelming. The regulations are, you, you, you can't just memorize that with um, one, one session. So um, don't attempt to go away from today understanding this um, completely, and, and don't try to change everything um, all at once. Just start small and go slow, like we're supposed to do with psychotropic medications, um, and just pick one X aspect, um, and then review and revise charts as the MDS becomes um, um, due, you know, perhaps over the course of, the, of a year working on this. And my recommendation would be to start with the antipsychotics, um, since um, there's a focus there and, and there's um, um, a mandate to reduce those by 50. 15% by the end of the year, which is um, fast approaching, as is our time for this session. So um, it looks like we have about nine minutes for question and um, discussion. Um, and it looks like there's a, um, a question that's come through um, on the question and answer board here. Um, on the care plan interventions, should we include when a decrease of psychotropics are due um, and the results of those decreases? Um, I guess it would probably depend on um, how your facility does things. Um, my preference would be to be a little bit more vague within the care plan because what happens is if on the care plan you put, um, you know, for example, resident is due for dose reduction July 3rd, um, 2013, and then you don't get to the dose reduction until July 5th, you're already um, out of compliance with your own care plan. So you might want to be a little bit more vague and say um, resident is due for um, dose reduction in July, and then you have a whole month. Um, to respond. Um, and then I typically, um, if you've tried a dose reduction and it hasn't been successful, I'll typically include an approach um, in the care, like an information only approach that says um, dosage reduction tried um, July 2013, um, symptoms reoccurred. Um, C um, interdisciplinary team progress note for additional information. So I'll put that there because um, it kind of serves as a, a, a flag that, yes, we've done this um, and reminds us where the information has been um, worth that. Thank you, Robin. Are there any other questions? You can type them in the Q&A, you can type them in the chat, or you can put up your electronic hand. <laughs> and then I will um, unmute you. Any, any, all right, while you're thinking of questions, let me just announce that our next webinar is scheduled for Wednesday, January 16th. Um, it will be presented by Paige Hector, and it is Psychosocial Assessment for Care Planning and Intervention. Um, that will begin the 15-session series of best practice nursing home social work, 
And I'm also asking folks on the line, if you have been in nursing home social work for three or more years, we would love to have you co-present on any of the 15 topics. So you can decide to either be the content expert or um, somebody with on-the-ground practice knowledge, but we're uh, seeking out nursing home social workers with three or more years of practice experience who are currently in the nursing home setting to co-present all 15 of those series and additional information is on the nursing home social work resource page. Are there any other questions? Let's see, Bob, I'm going to unmute you. Go ahead, Bob Conley. Yeah, hi. Um, uh, this was a very excellent presentation. And I guess my question when you're dealing with MADS and interdisciplinary team, that the doctors who's ordering this and who may is a key player in this, and the nurses are so responsible for dosage, how do you deal with the physician role and the social service role in this to kind of alert the physician of these symptoms and um, uh, changes that really affects his or her uh, dosage. Yeah, that's. Uh, I'm glad that you um, asked that um, question, Bob, because um, sometimes what happens with um, physicians is, you know, they're busy folks and they haven't memorized these. Um, regulations of and not that I have either but um, you know they may have less awareness of them than we do so we have a, a role to play and when I say we I mean nursing home um, personnel um, in general not just social services but we have a role to educate um, the physician about regulations and and remembering that it says in the guidelines to service to surveyors um, the red book that I mentioned um, that justification that, well, the doctor ordered it, um, isn't sufficient. So the regulations um, put a, a responsibility on us to do that physician education. And um, the way that I always um, did that is I did my chart reviews, and when I noticed maybe medications that were, um, you know, where our documentation wasn't quite up to snuff in terms of justification, I would communicate that um, to um, the nurses, um, the, the, the charge nurse or the director of nursing, and that um, person would then contact um, the physician and um, do the, the education. But, you know, I was the one who provided the information about here's what you need to talk with the doctor um, about. And that worked um, very uh, well for me, and it, it helped. Um, it helped the physician as well because they weren't getting phone calls from multiple different People. It was the um, consistent people who would call anyway about other issues related to the um, the residents. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it looks like there's a uh, question here. Do you have any recommendations for care planning individuals with psychiatric diagnosis? but do not actively display any symptoms. Um, for example, they have schizophrenia, um, but symptoms are relatively dormant, and individual is not taking um, psychotropic medications. Well, that makes it easy when they're not on any psychotropic medications. Um, I would just note um, if you have um, a care plan that just re relates to their overall um, adjustment to the nursing home or adjustment to whatever condition they have that brought them in the facility to just have a couple of approaches um, on there about um, what the person's symptoms were in the past, um, information about potential triggers, like someone with schizophrenia who's um, just gone dormant, but um, it can be triggered by the holiday season or um, is triggered by an anniversary reaction, you know, if they had a, a loved one who, 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 who died in the spring. And so in the spring they always have a hard time. Just kind of note these are things to be um, aware of. That's um, how, how um, 
I would I would do it. Um, and it's a more complex issue when they're not having any symptoms and they're on an antipsychotic medication because we don't know, well, is it because the medication is working or is it because they don't really need it anymore? And so that's almost when you would need to do uh, a dose reduction, even though it's been um, contraindicated in the past. Because sometimes people can um, decline um, so much physically that um, it masks their psychiatric diagnosis and they don't need the medicine anymore. Okay, thank you. Our hour is up. I want to thank you, Robin, uh, Dr. Robin Boniface, in particular for this excellent presentation and also for providing all the handouts um, so that people can have some of the tools that you've used and some that you've developed. And I'd also like to thank uh, Dr. Kelsey Simons for helping to organize this and Bob Connolly for their support in the webinar series. Thank you, everybody, and a recording of this will be posted within 24 hours. Bye-bye. Bye. Is anybody left?